All right. Oh, we're about three minutes after. I do think that Pratik uh, will join. Uh, and I expect Pranav probably will as well. In the meantime, if you guys want to um, sign in, so to speak, uh, in the meeting minutes, please do. Got a couple of a couple of topics today. Also, if you have topics to suggest today, um, you know, feel free to um, toss those in as well. As a point of order, just a reminder: um, these are you know public. Um, community uh, meetings and so as such they're being recorded and so we'll we'll post these to the community channel um, just after the just after the call um, um, uh, one quick update uh, I know uh, <coughs> Pratik and Pranav probably would be joining a bit late uh, I mean I don't know if they will be but uh, Point is that uh, Pratik actually reached out to me yesterday, and uh, he has set up a Kubernetes cluster. And um, you know, I, I told him to you know use the Docker instructions for setting up Meshri. Um, looks like he was successful. He hasn't uh, given me a, a, an acknowledgement on that, but I, you know, he, we we were at the point where pretty late yesterday, like you know, he was asking for the final set of instructions. So just kind of okay. Okay, that's progress. That's good. And uh, you didn't hear anything from Pranav this week, did you? Uh, no, uh, it was just pretty. Okay. Okay. Well, we are five after. We do have. We do have a few folks, so maybe um, let's let's jump in if we could. Uh, no one new to introduce today, I don't believe, other than um, Vanille. I don't know if you got a chance to meet uh, Pavan. Um, and so Pavon is, uh, joined us last week and is, um, busy trying to get some of our AWS infrastructure in place so that, um, test results can be persisted and, and people can optionally, um, store them there. So, um, Pavon meet Vanilla. He's over at, uh, over at VMware. Yeah, hi, Vanilla. Hi, Vanilla. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, very good. Uh, Vanilla's over at, oh, at Vanilla, you're in uh, VMware, kind of in the Wavefront area, focused on an Istio adapter for Wavefront previously. Um, what I'm else? sorry, I lost you actually. Oh, wait, say it again, Vanilla? Yeah, I, I couldn't hear you. I think there was some connectivity issue. Oh, okay. Can you say that again? Yeah. Uh, I was just uh, trying to do my best to, to introduce you, and that is to say that you're at at VMware, kind of in the Wavefront area. You'd written an Istio adapter for Wavefront, and then are continuing to focus. Uh, I work in the Open Source Technology Center at VMware, oh. not specifically with uh, Wavefront, but uh, I did create the adapter. Yeah, I focused on Envoy and this Oh, got it. Okay. Even better. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Is, nice is, to meet you, Vanilla. Yeah. Oh. yeah, and then uh, Yogi, I didn't realize you didn't, hadn't met Vanilla either. Oh. At the, and Yogi, I don't know if you want to introduce to Vanilla real quick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yogi and Vidal um, have been playing hide and seek for the past few years. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah. where where to start? Uh, <laughs> I used to work at AT&T Labs until yesterday, and yesterday was my last day at AT&T Labs. Now I'm actually back in the market looking for opportunities. Um, uh, so my focus was mostly on AI and machine learning strategy, but right now I'm actually, with this project, I'm helping with some of the, uh, you can, I wouldn't call it as uh, grunt work, but actually making layer file look uh, nifty. And uh, in addition to that, Girish assigned me a task uh, five weeks ago uh, to see, to come up with the ideas of Meshery Grafana integration. 
And uh, I got a chance to work on it most recently. And uh, I'll go over what my findings are in this call. I'm not there yet. Uh, when I say uh, it's not a con uh, conclusive report, uh, but I, I do have some really good amount of uh, stuff to talk about regarding that. So that's my uh, just related work here. Okay, I'm just sending one final uh, invite over to Pranav and Pratik because I know they're um, they're keen on the project. So, and if I've got the wrong link in the meeting in the meeting invite, then maybe they're in the wrong one. So, okay, um, very good. Uh, a bit of an update, a little bit of a uh, mostly an update. I, I mentioned before that. Um, the intention is to do a couple of um, upcoming demos of the project. Uh, it is an alpha state project, so we are demoing it pretty early. But uh, part of the point of the project is to be um, service mesh agnostic or multi mesh capable. And as we go to do that, involving those different product or rather projects and vendors early, I think helps facilitate buy in. So it's a little bit of a horse before the cart or chicken before the egg issue um, but uh, but it forces our hand to get some things done I think the one that will probably really force it is um, the, the presentation um, at, at container world so um, vanil is also on the Istio uh, UX working group or shows up there and is um, helping advance that initiative so vanil um, maybe in a couple weeks as we're as we're discussing there, I, I, I suspect you'll have a few things to say as well. So that, that'll be, that'll be great. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, maybe uh, in sequence of what's easier to cover, maybe um, this first one here is, is a bit easier to cover. Um, so, so one of the service meshes that, that you guys may have noticed in the landscape that we have is uh, one called Octarine. And so if you go to the landscape, um, you'll find a link to Octarine. Uh, and the notion that they are uh, Envoy based, they are um, have yet to GA their offering. Um, they are security oriented in nature in terms of the use cases and value that they will add. Uh, and we just got done meeting with them um, earlier this morning. Uh, there's a new repository created for an adapter for them, uh, which you can you can see out in the, uh, the communities uh, area. So just a freshly created uh, repository for that adapter. They're going to take a look over this next week to familiarize more with the project itself, and um, already discussed their approach to how they might uh, hook in, how how they're going to uh, create the adapter. So I think they're in the process of creating um, some Helm charts now, and, and may look to leverage those in the adapter. So Vanille and um, Garish of the work that's been done inside the um, Istio, the, the Meshery Istio adapter, that will serve as a good example for um, the Octarine adapter. Uh, absolutely, uh, a good starting point for sure. Um, so speaking, speaking of which, um, Vanille was, um, I, I'm trying to remember, was the Linkerd adapter one area of interest for you? So I was going to focus on, on Istio initially, but like if Linkerd, uh, like if you need help with Linkerd, then yeah, I can pitch in. Got it, got it, okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see well, it's hard to take notes and type at the, or talk and type at the same time. Um, uh, okay, then moving on then, um, maybe the next uh, thing that, that we could chat through is a bit of um, what we refer to as Meshery SaaS right now. Um, my perspective is it probably needs a new name. And this particular component isn't intended to be um, user-facing per se. It is intended to provide value to users of the tool um, and mostly just a cloud-based storage system. 
you know, cloud-based authentication and storage system so that people can uh, create a quick account and store their results, retrieve results, and then um, in an anonymous way, uh, compare results from different, different people who've used the tool. And as such, we'll just need a, a nominal amount of, of uh, cloud-based infrastructure. And so uh, last week, Pavon um, extraordinarily quickly uh, <laughs> jumped in um, to help out. And so Pavon, do you want to talk, talk about some of the progress that you've made? Um, Liam, sorry to jump in. Um, I, I, if I remember correctly, Yogi actually wanted to jump out in like 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. So maybe if we can actually bring his point uh, of discussion first. I'm, I'm sorry, Pawan, I'm not trying to stop you there. Uh, but, you know, uh, given the time, like, uh, Yogi has to jump out, you know, I, I'm just trying to help him out. Yeah, I can totally understand. That's fine. Yes. Girish likes to pick on me, so I'll go. Go ahead. <laughs> So, uh, uh, let's start there. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, Grish, that's a good point. So, um, when I when I explored some of the data sources uh, that Grafana officially supports, uh, we do have uh, Elasticsearch, CloudWatch, InfluxDB, and some of the other tools that it officially supports. But then there are other tools that can be supported via plugins. So, when I looked at our uh, the meshery. I do see that we have uh, integrations with DynamoDB. Uh, so if we are going to go down the AWS route and host this on AWS, so the easiest uh, and seamless integration would be through uh, using DynamoDB. There are some third-party plugins which actually uh, load the DynamoDB into Grafana directly, but uh, since those are unofficial, what we, we can leverage something like CloudWatch. So pushing, injecting the Dynamo, uh, CloudWatch integrates with the DynamoDB. And what happens is that Grafana has a direct uh, plugin integration with the CloudWatch. Uh, that's one approach. The second approach that um, would be using any of the NoSQL uh, open source databases, right? It, it, uh, it could be, a, okay. Uh, Stepping back, can be NoSQL or can be something as simple as Postgres because uh, I know that right now, although we're going to have a whole bunch of data sources, it is going to be uh, somewhat structured and organized. So we don't necessarily have to go with, um, uh, what do you call, NoSQL. But let's say if we want to support the a non-hierarchical structure of the data, then there are uh, there are other methods like, for example, even JSON, right? Uh, having uh, having to load the data into JSON, and then uh, Grafana has a data source integration plugin, uh, official data source plugin integration in, uh, for the JSON data as well. So um, so those were uh, those were some of the officially supported integration types that I looked into. And again, this was just a preliminary uh, look and preliminary um, setup. So these are all easier integration methods. The, the reason I say easier is because uh, pumping, it, pumping data into JSON and loading it into Grafana uh, is something that, uh, that can be done in a breeze. Whereas a Dynamo Deviant CloudWatch, that's something that uh, we are again relying on the AWS ecosystem uh, to be able to do that. But then incorporating any uh, internal databases, like even NoSQL or Postgres, would also be a much simpler task. The reason I say that is for NoSQL, you could just uh, basically index it by, uh, you can call it as a, a key, value, uh, key value pair. And then Grafana has a really great uh, integration with the uh, no SQL databases, so you can just load the uh, load load the data, break it down uh, by the uh, by the you can call it as data elements or data types, and it can automatically let you visualize the data. And the other thing that I have experience in doing is the Elastic, uh, especially Elastic's integration with uh, Grafana is also uh, extremely powerful. 
the main reason is, uh, for example... Okay, and what, Yogi, actually, before we talk about Elastic, which is yet, um, which, which we're not using in the project, I think the, you may have covered it, but the, the question here is whether or not we can easily take um, like either leveraging Grafana's API uh, or some other fashion to take and embed a Grafana chart into the Meshery UI. And at least thus far, what I've, what I've seen, it's just been through iframes, which is not ideal. Okay. Uh, actually, I haven't explored that yet. Uh, I'll go ahead and do some diligence on that. Okay. Um, basically, I, I'm start, I started documenting all those notes. So, uh, so right now, uh, my first focus, pr uh, primary focus has been how do we get the data into Grafana no, to be yeah, able to yeah. render that. No, that's right. that's kind of taken care of already through the exposure of Prometheus compatible, um, the kind of the, the uh, de facto exposure of metrics from either from the data plane or the control plane of, of the various service meshes is fairly ubiquitously um, a Prometheus uh, exposition format. And Grafana mm -hmm. has the ability to, you know, natively interfaces with that format. Uh, it can get those statistics and graph them. And so the what we would wanted to do in the project is um, leverage that beyond leverage Grafana and its graphing ability more to provide a more a better experience inside the Meshery UI, um, uh, as opposed to using Chart JS, okay. which is less. So. Okay, uh, I'll do diligence on that uh, this evening, and uh, and I'll actually uh, create a document and share that with this community. Okay. Uh, uh, Yogi, uh, actually, uh, what, what Lee said is right, but uh, what you just said is also partly in, uh, interesting to us in the context that, so uh, the reason why we went to ChartJS was actually, I mean, it was really easy to get the data, plus, you know, we are piggybacking on port IO, so, you know, the results we are getting from port IO, you know, I don't have to pre-process or do anything, you know, I was just giving it to the ChartJS uh, library, um, which, I mean, not the direct one, but instead, like, you know, uh, what the port IO guys have done is they have just written some kind of some extra functions, which feed the data in a particular format to the ChartJS. I've just tried to reutilize that. Now, if if I mean uh, the the one that was very interesting to me was actually that you said the you know the uh, Grafana has the data source, which to which we can actually feed just raw JSON data, and that Grafana can actually render that. Now, uh, if if we can actually get that to work, um, plus I mean uh, it's not a single thing; it, it's a combination in the sense. So if we can get the get the part of feeding JSON data into Grafana and creating a dashboard to work. That's the first part. The second part is that, get, uh, you know, figuring out the ability to bring in Grafana charts and, and embedding it in the Meshery UI. Now, if we are able to do the second one, the first one is extremely valuable. So in which case we can completely move away from charges. So you see the point? Uh, Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. What you found is, is, is definitely uh, interesting, uh, great. Uh, because uh, plus, uh, you know what, like, I mean, uh, direct integration with the data source, uh, well, like you said, uh, you know, brings in dependence with the backend infrastructure. Uh, plus, if, for example, like you know, we want to add in some control over what data is being rendered, uh, we will lose that. So I think uh, it's it'll be more interesting, like if we can actually get the JSON data uh, and feed it into Grafana uh, in a way that you know it can actually uh, and you know create a dashboard which can you know be rendered, like you know, with the data that's given to it, uh, will be will be great. Uh, plus. Ability to uh, get the Grafana charts and put it in Meshery UI. Now, uh, without the second one, I think the first one is probably not that useful. Um, hmm. So, uh, what you what you have given us is definitely like you know, very valuable. But now we have the other part of the puzzle, like you know, which we have to figure out, which is exactly what Lee mentioned. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I'll I'll do some diligence on that um, today, and tomorrow, and then I'll uh, submit it, create a document, and share that with the community. Awesome. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you, Yogi. Oh, thank you. And then, <clears throat> Vanilla, you brought up a good point as well. And I, I uh, re refresh my memory. The the place where Prometheus metrics are being exposed, um, is that uh, with respect to Ford I.O.? Or is that um, just through from Istio itself, you mean? Mm -hmm. 
Well, Istio. So oh, yeah. I think Istio and LinkedIn both have that already. So it's going to be easy to leverage uh, that to create Grafana uh, dashboards. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, maybe before we move out of core, if we want to talk about um, uh, some front end uh, rearchitecture. Absolutely. So um, people on this call, pretty much, I think everybody has seen the measure demo. Uh, like, I mean, uh, as of to like last week, we were at a point where the UI was functional, but of course, like, you know, the UI was not the best, uh, given that, like, you know, um, it, it started off as a, you know, kind of a playground project. And, you know, we just tried to continue adding features to it with very little UI customizations. Um, you know, uh, this week we actually, uh, uh, me and Lee had a discussion as to, you know, if at all, like, you know, we want to uh, make the UI better, this is probably a good time before we start more, uh, before we start pouring more features into Meshery. Plus, um, the you know, um, right now we have like uh, HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Like I mean, like plain HTML, JavaScript, CSS with Bootstrap uh, that was used for just giving you know some nice touch to the UI. But other than that, it was pretty much like HTML, JavaScript. So uh, what we did uh, this week is actually to reconsider our decision on the UI and uh, see if we can actually prioritize it, given the fact that you're going to be presenting Meshery uh, at several venues, like you know, so we thought uh, this might actually be a good time to kind of reconsider our UI decisions. So um, I conducted some research like you know, over the last weekend, um, and uh, we actually chose Next.js. Uh, for the for the front end, of course, Next.js also has a server, but we are not going to be using the server side of it. Uh, we're going to be using Next.js, exporting the contents, and then using it to uh, you know using it to feed the UI while the backend still stays uh, the same, stays the same. Uh, now uh, with uh, Next.js, uh, not sure if you guys are familiar with Next.js. So Next.js is actually a, like a framework that's built on top of React, um, and uh, React has like a you know, huge ecosystem. So you know um, it, it it makes uh, Developing uh, React applications slightly better, but uh, still, like you know, we'll still be dealing with React components. If you guys know, like, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and then for uh, for store management or for state management, um, I'm, I'm I'm leveraging Redux. So uh, so essentially, like I mean, uh, uh, and uh, the other interesting fact is I've never worked with React or Redux or Next.js or anything of that sort. So it was a learning experience for me. Uh, so what I can probably do is I can try to show you guys like you know what I have for now. Uh, I do have something functional, but it's not yet into a functional, of course, like you know because it was uh, literally like you know a build from scratch, uh, kind of a project. So uh, you guys can see yeah. my screen. Yeah. You guys can see my screen. Uh, yeah. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, and are you seeing the setup mesh? The material UI. Yes. Okay, awesome. So, um, what are you seeing here is actually uh, the sort of the template for the new page uh, or the new site. Uh, so you can see that you know it, it's of course like a you know, plain JavaScript. Uh, and uh, now, if I actually click between pages, uh, of course, like you know, my server is not running. I'm sorry about that. But essentially, um, you know, I'm going to be bringing it back in like a minute. Okay, awesome. So um, yeah, the server is coming up in like a minute. So essentially, uh, the UI uh, for the UI. Uh, so apart from Next.js for the framework, uh, and then using React components, and then using Redux for the state management, one of the other things we chose was actually uh, leverage Google's Material UI. Uh, so the nice thing is like uh, the Material UI folks have actually created a library uh, for React, so which is kind of a very nice thing. So um, one of my first experiments was actually to Get all the three components to work well with one another, uh, which was uh, which was uh, which was a fun experiment. Um, a lot of moving parts, a lot of unknowns, like you know, and uh, you know, uh, I was able to figure little things out. So uh, right now, like you know, what you're seeing is uh, of course like Mastery SaaS. Okay, and then I'm going to try to log in um, and then authorize the app. And once the authorization is back, you can see it actually lands in the new UI. 
of course, like you can see, the intermediate transitions have to be fixed, which I'll be working on. So at the moment, like I have this template. Um, so on the right top, like you know, there is an avatar, but you know, I'm still like you know, uh, getting the pieces you know, together. Uh, so here, uh, right now, I have two pages that are functional. Like you know, one is uh, you can see uh, play with mesh. On, on the left, like I have three menu items, sort of uh, you know, mapping to the current version of uh, uh, the meshery. Uh, so uh, there is one for load test, there is one for play, and then there is one for uh, setup mesh. So uh, the placeholders, like are the, the the content of the pages will actually be filled. But uh, what I've done so far is actually kind of the interesting part, like you know, where setting up Next.js with Material UI with Redux was uh, was actually some very crucial parts. So now that I have that foundation laid out, like you know, now writing components will actually be just a matter of uh, creating JavaScript files, uh, you know, and, and essentially creating React components with the functionality. Um, and the other crucial part, which I which I accomplished today morning, was actually that. Uh, up until yesterday, uh, this UI was uh, working with uh, Next.js server um, on its own. So today morning, um, I actually restructured uh, Meshery code uh, in order to make it work with uh, the uh, static version of the generated UI code. So what you're seeing now is actually the Meshery UI served by the Meshery backend server, but uh, the page itself is actually a single page application, so it's not really hitting the backend. Um, all, all the interactions that are happening here, um, like you know, are actually just local, uh, local to the uh, local to the browser. Uh, so that's kind of how Next.js works. Um, it essentially is a single page application, but it, it gives a feel that it is actually you know a multi page application. So uh, so pretty much like I have all this setup in place. So I have to start working on the components. Uh, I also have created all the necessary endpoints for getting the data, retrieving. The user information, etc. So, you know, uh, like I said, um, it's just uh, um, I have to start stitching the components together. Now. So, um, uh, pretty much like you know, a huge accomplishment, uh, at least like you know, the, the, the way I see it. So, uh, that's pretty much uh, measure demo as it stands today. Uh, I'm pretty sure, like you know, by next week uh, we'll have uh, things pretty close to uh, where they were uh, like last week in terms of functionality. Uh, that's pretty much uh, the updates for Meshery. <clears throat> and the work thus far is available in the new UI branch? Uh, that's really cool. Uh, awesome. Can uh, you Lee, you're talking about oh. Yeah, yeah, hey, hey, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, Lee, I think you're talking no, about no, Git. Uh, but... Sorry, back to you. Yeah, I was saying, uh, can you show the code a little bit to see how it looks like? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, yeah. I mean, given the time, I wasn't sure, like, you know, if uh, people would be interested. But yeah, absolutely. Cool. Uh, yeah, if it is. Yeah, yeah. No, no uh, I don't mind. Absolutely. Like, I mean, uh, as long as, like, I mean, uh, I hope uh, other people. Yeah. Uh, there you go. I mean, um, so uh, Lee actually just pasted. Uh, uh, Lee, can you also share that in the Slack? Yeah. Uh, so Lee actually just shared a link in the. Uh, <laughs> In the uh, Hangouts chat, the Hangouts chat are like I don't know, freaking flaky. But uh, but essentially, like uh, uh, I I pushed like you know um, a commit a few hours back, like you know where you know it, it gets the UI and the backend to actually work with one another well. So where is code? Uh, so by the way, I'm, I'm using code for development. Actually, yes. Okay, so. You guys see my uh, my text editor code? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So this is uh, the Meshery uh, project. Of course, like you know, uh, you know, all my changes have been committed uh, as of like an hour or two back. So pretty much, like you know, you should be able to see the way uh, you know uh, it is in my uh, local editor. So um, right now, the the previous uh, the, the components that were retained from the previous structure are the CMD folder, which contains the main. Deployment YAMLs, I think, has changed there. The handlers, uh, quite a bit has changed uh, because, like, you know, earlier uh, I was using Go templates to actually render pages. Um, you know, on uh, when, for example, like, you know, when a, when a particular URL is hit, etc. But now, like, you know, I have actually transitioned those to move away from templates. So uh, most of the calls here, like, you know, will actually be just returning a JSON or an header. Uh, so uh, that was one of the changes that was uh, recently done. Uh, in meshes, there is no change in the models. Uh, there is no change. Uh, there, there is a change, like in the sense, 
I changed the uh, I changed the uh, handler interface. Uh, that's pretty much it. And the public was actually the old uh, UI folder, which contained uh, all the user interface components like static, HTML files, um, etc. Um, and router was again again it's an old thing. Like you know, I just added some extra endpoints here. Uh, pretty much. Uh, for the Felicon and like, all the other endpoints, like, I changed them a bit in the sense earlier we used to have the play slash something, so they're all now changed. Uh, the the UI is actually being served just by a simple handler, which actually serves contents from a static folder. Uh, now that includes JavaScript, CSS, uh, HTML, uh, and uh, images. So essentially, that's actually the folder where uh as code uh, which is export will actually be placed so i thought like i'll just reuse it like today so uh that's kind of where the contents are being served from uh and of course like you know you guys know like you know, this is the favicon all the other ones at the top like you know are the apis and logging logo handlers um and now the ui folder is actually the the main part um the dot next folder is is an internal folder that's maintained by uh by next um uh, you know, where it actually keeps its working copies uh, and, uh, you know, the temporary files. So that's something which, I, which is not generated by me, but rather by Next. Now, the, the folders where I work are the components, uh, the lib folder, um, and then and then uh, the pages folder. Now, the way Next works is that every uh, JavaScript file in the pages folder will actually be rendered as a page. So you can see the about. When I went to slash about, you know, that's the file that served. Uh, index is the index, and then the post is a post. Like you know, so if you guys can actually uh, you know uh, map it to my existing UI. But now the interesting part is actually uh, uh, that uh, there are some underscore files, like the underscore app and underscore document, are crucial files for Nest. Uh, next, uh, usually if people are just working with uh, like normal functionality, they don't have to create those files. But in our case, like I have to create the files for two reasons. One is that. Uh, in order to work, in order to get things work with uh, the Google's uh, Google's material UI, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually uh, I thought it would be better to use this. So what's happening is uh, you can actually see all the import statements at the top. Uh, you can see like you know, a lot of the material UI core, material UI um, uh, stuff here, and then you can also see the React products uh, here, uh, and the immutable. The immutable is essentially for state management. Uh, now here are some team CSS and the team uh, configuration files uh, at the top, uh, which are pretty much borrowed from one of uh, Material UI's teams. Excuse me. Uh, and then comes the render component. Now the render component contains uh, the entire HTML section uh, with all the uh, HTML elements that are created through React components. Now this is essentially what forms the outer layout of the page. And that this one line here, the component, uh, is where the remaining pages will actually get injected. Now, at the bottom, you can actually see that, like you know, uh, there are quite a bit of wrappers there. So the width styles is what uh, you know injects the uh, material UI styles um, and feeds it into the application. Uh, sort of like, and if you guys know um, the injection process, um, like in Spring and, and other frameworks, like you know, uh, so this is essentially similar to that. Um, along with, so I have two levels of injections here. So one is with styles. Um, it'll actually inject uh, some style-related components in, and then you can see the next one is the with Redux. So this is where you know I'm constructing a, a store for the for working with Redux, and now that sits on top of the page, where it, like you know, so uh, there is a, a common store, and uh, you know all the components like you know, will be working off of the state in the store. It's kind of like you know, how I'm setting it up. Uh, and then finally, like you know, so the Meshery app is kind of the main application. So this uh, this code here is the Meshery app. So you, you know, scroll up, you'll be able to see the class. Sorry, scroll a bit too fast. Right there. Sorry, yeah, right there. So that's the class. Essentially, this is how. Uh, uh, you know, like, uh, this is essentially, I think, following ES6 uh, syntax uh, in JavaScript and, and uh, using uh, Next.js app as a starting point. Uh, if you look at all the other pages, like you know, they are pretty uh, pretty straightforward. Um, in the sense, again, like you know, there's some style, but like you can see, every page is essentially a React component, um, and then like you can see, um, there are some states that are being maintained, um, and then the rest is all like you know, uh, either material UI components or our own components, you know, which we can actually render. Uh, the other interesting point is actually in the components folder. So now uh, the theme itself, like the entire layer of the theme, is made up of two other files. One is the header. Uh, so the header uh, essentially is the top part. Uh, not exclude. Uh, I mean, not including the menu. So it's it's from after the menu up on right end of the page. 
Uh, now here, uh, the interesting thing is actually uh, getting the title uh, and the user information usually gets displayed there. So um, the way I'm getting the title to actually work here, like I'm not, I'm not sure if you remember, like you know, every time I clicked on a different page, the title automatically changed. So again, like you know, at the bottom of the page, you will see that um, it is actually getting getting pretty much data from Redux. Now the connect is actually a, a, a Redux function, like you know, which uh, what it essentially does is um, you can actually do a bunch of things. One here, um, I'm actually passing it a function where it is retrieving a particular value from the state and injecting it um, into the header component as uh, props. Now, what I'm doing here essentially is, if you look closely at the title, um, so the title is, is read from the props, uh, which is fed by Redux, uh, and then I'm actually rendering it here. So that's kind of how that injection works. Uh, it was very exciting to actually learn this. So now the same way, uh, there is actually, uh, if, if you guys see this avatar uh, section here, uh, now, uh, I have, yeah, that, this is the part I'm going to be working on next where um, I have the uh, endpoints for getting the user data uh, up and ready. And what I have to do is I have to create a user component and then I'll be injecting my component here so that it will be able to get the user information and you know replace the image with the right avatars and also display the username like uh, the uh, old measure you uh, was doing. Um, so, uh, so the same way, like I mean, so this is just for the header component uh, and then the other one is a navigator. So which is on the left. Uh, the page again is a bit huge, but essentially it contains a lot of style elements. Uh, and pretty much uh, you can see it's, it's also a React component. So uh, you know, like I said, uh, and then uh, here, uh, based on the current uh, URL of the page, I'm actually uh, making judgment call on what the title should be, uh, for which I have a, a collection here, like you know, an array of objects where I'm maintaining the uh, name of the, uh, the title of the page and the, and the URL mapping. So based on this, uh, what this update title does is it gets the path, it computes the path with some computation, and then once it finds the path, um, it actually calls a particular function. And the uh, interesting thing about this function is that this is actually, uh, 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 if, if you guys uh, know about Redux uh, actions, I know this is a Redux action. So what this does is it actually creates a path and a title uh, object and then pushes it in. Uh, to uh, as a as a re Redux action and essentially in the background uh, there are reducers which which update the store uh, and uh, to know about reducers so there is a lib folder uh, there is a store.js file and if you guys go into this file you will see like I have I tried to comment it so this is a reducer so essentially like you know so what it does is when a state change comes in uh, it tries to update the state by using a particular function here. Um, and again, like you know, the merge deep is a, is an immutable uh, function, like which means like immutable is a library from Facebook. Um, so it is actually based off of that. And uh, essentially, it actually uh, updates the state in sort of uh, while keeping the immutability uh, concept of Redux intact. Um, so essentially, the way it works is so anytime like you know a state change happens in Redux, all the components that are uh, using data from it will automatically get the data and you know and uh, Redux and React, uh, you know, they have this tie up, like, you know, to a library called React Redux or Redux React, Redux React, I forgot the name of the library. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's something like uh, React Redux, uh, you know, and what that does is when all these changes happen, they automatically trigger a rendering of that component on the page. So, so I have pretty much like, you know, all these chainings put together. So the underlying infrastructure is ready. So now I just have to sit down and start, um, you know, adding components uh, to the page. So, uh, Pretty much like you know most of the heavy lifting is actually done so uh the other part is that so now all the code is here so the way um uh, i'm i'm getting it to work with the back end is that there is a there are two steps which i do like in the package json uh one is a build step you can see it is using next uh to uh, to run build uh so what this does is it actually builds the uh, javascript uh code uh, and then uh, i have to run this export uh, now what this export does is it actually takes all the code and then creates a package that, that we can use elsewhere because by default, Nextcode runs you know, using uh, its own backend server. So uh, the next export, it actually generates a file and puts it inside the out folder. Uh, now in the out folder, you can see for every page that's created, uh, there is a folder um, and, uh, and there are some HTML files in each of them. Essentially, uh, this is to support the capability that if people, for example, go to uh, at the about page directly, then they should still have the HTML, etc. All the static files that are generated are inside the underscore next folder, and you can see the static. 
and it contains a lot of uh, folders. Now, the way this does is, uh, and and uh, the other one of the main reasons, like you know, we chose Next was that uh, Next actually does uh, a wonderful job with bundling contents appropriately, so that uh, it doesn't kind of bundle everything into a single large JavaScript file. But rather, what it does is based on the pages they are used in, etc. It actually kind of bundles the contents uh, intelligently. So when we go and request for a particular page, the number of resources uh, or the number of JavaScript CSS files, uh, number of JavaScript files which are downloaded are pretty small in size, uh, and only the needed components are downloaded. All the other things are actually like you know uh, downloaded only when uh, those are hit. Uh, plus, uh, we can also make uh, uh, leverage uh, this capability of uh, Next, where it can actually prefetch contents. So for example, again, when we load the index page. We can actually ask it to prefetch all the other pages in the background. So by the time we go to the other pages, uh, they're all prefetched, and like you know, the page really loads way faster. So, so yeah, that's pretty much a uh, super quick rundown of uh, Next.js with Menagerie. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, thanks for explaining all the details. I think it's a really nice framework to use. Yeah, it is. It is actually. I mean, like I said, I mean, up until like I would say like uh, up until like Wednesday um, uh, or like Tuesday. Yeah, up, up until like Tuesday evening, um, I have I have no experience with React or Redux or Next.js or or a, any of these JavaScript frameworks. Uh, I I've used to work with uh, Angular, Angular two, etc. But then yeah, th this was a uh, um, yeah. Th there were a lot of unknowns, but it was a very interesting journey uh, for the past three days. Uh, I would say. There's definitely a lot more to learn, but uh, Next.js definitely helps a lot uh, with uh, providing stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, 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 um, it's it's wonderful actually. Uh, so hopefully, like you know, once we uh, in about a few more days, uh, once we have all the other components functioning, um, I think uh, we'll be in a state where uh, UI developers will feel much more comfortable to join the project and contribute uh, if if need be. Uh, uh, and same with the case of the back end, uh, you know, the Go developers like you know should be uh, should be comfortable like you know, seeing the code. So uh, that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you guys have any questions, I mean, uh, on anything, you know, feel free to actually hit me up on Slack. Yeah, very good. Barish, when, have to Bar Barish, when do you expect that um, that it will be that branch will be in a place where others might be able to contribute? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I was sort of concerned uh, about getting the backend to work for the frontend. Now that I have that functioning, which was which was good, um, I'm pretty sure like probably in the next uh, few days, like you know, I would say like you know, mid next week, uh, we might have uh, several components already in place, and other people can actually start looking at it, and you know, okay, uh, okay. if needed, like you know, very they can definitely okay. participate. Very, very good, very good. Let's uh, let's move on to to, uh, to the update from Pavon, and then let's uh, talk briefly about. A couple of areas where um, that that vanilla might be interested in, as we go. Uh, so we have Pavan, maybe uh, over to you. Um, yeah, hi. <clears throat> uh, last week I just created. Uh, I was working on uh, uh, creation of this Terraform, uh, deploying of AWS and uh, EC2 in AWS EC2 instance, DynamoDB and API Gateway, and uh, and I tested it like it, it's successful. Uh, do you want me to demo over here or like? Yeah, that, yeah that'd be great. Uh, sure, like just one second. key and secret key like so I have another uh, uh, file where it represents the variables like for access key and uh, secret key and so if you want to deploy it in another AWS instead of uh, my own AWS like we can change those access key and secret key and we can deploy it and I have chosen the reason as US uh, East to <clears throat> and coming to the DynamoDB table it's like uh, it's a the name of the the project or name of the table which we have to create 
as per the testing i just created uh, the read capacity and the write capacity and uh, given as one one attribute over here and so <clears throat> so after that like uh, so i have to create an a, a ec2 instance and so it's like uh, and i'm just taking like a very basic ec2 instance like which is t2 micro and i'm giving as the different predefined ami over here which is uh, given by aws over here by aws and uh, and here is this uh, api gateway uh, like just given the the name and like the description to create um <laughs> Nice. Well, I guess, you know, um, Garish, considering that like this T2 micro instance is provisioned, um, well, last week we talked a little bit about Circle CI and kind of the, the process by which a new binary might be pushed. Um, Correct. I think that that's fairly doable within a... Um, absolutely. Uh, definitely. We should, yeah, um, I'm pretty sure. Like, and... Uh, the other thing is, I mean, like, you know, um, so, uh, you know what, you know, let me, let me actually start, uh, with, uh, with, uh, Pawan. Uh, hey, hey, Pawan, uh, this is a great start. Man. Uh, now, uh, the points, uh, which, uh, uh, or the next, uh, steps of, uh, next steps for you are that, uh, what you've created is, is, a, is a Terraform button, which is great, but the way, uh, we should be doing it is actually that you should be creating a module out of it. I mean, it, it sounds complex, but it, it's not, trust me. So the way it'll be is that you'll be creating a module off of it, and then you'll have uh, you know specific configurations for environments. Uh, that's how you'll be uh, organizing your Terraform code. Um, that is one thing. Uh, plus, uh, the next thing is uh, for the um, for the API gateway, uh, we also have to like you know figure out like you know how we can create mappings. Um, we don't have we don't need to have much fancier mappings. Like you know we can just start off with star like in this I mean slash, which means that anything under slash. Will actually be just handed over to the mesh resource. Uh, so that is uh, one other thing. Uh, and then with the uh, with the provisioning of the uh, EC2 instance, uh, we also have to give it the starter script. Like I forgot what the terminology is in the sense. I mean, uh, uh, you, you know what? Like, like I said, I have uh, I have some complex Terraform uh, script, like, you know, which I've done for uh, one of our workshops. Yeah, I, so I can actually share remember. with you. Yeah, okay. I, uh, I, I'm sorry, like, I, I didn't reach out to you after that, but uh, but I, I will reach out to you, like, and I'll probably share that code with you. Uh, so it'll, it'll give you some idea. Uh, and the okay. other thing is, uh, uh, the most important one is actually uh, maintaining state. So the way Terraform works is, like, you know, when you run it, uh, it'll actually maintain a state on your local uh, in, a, in a folder. Uh, but what we would, what would be ideal is that, like, you know, we would want to maintain state sort of globally. Uh, and by globally, in the sense, uh, we can actually use two of AWS's entities for maintaining states. Uh, one is uh, S3 for, for keeping the state and a Dynamo table for maintaining a lock. Um, so um, there is one library uh, which I can refer you to. Uh, it's called Terra Grunt. Um, take a look at it. Uh, now what that does is it, uh, without you having to go ahead and like, you know, writing logic to manage the state with S3, Dynamo, blah, blah, uh, it takes care of that thing, which is kind of very cool. So instead of using Terraform apply or Terraform plan, you would be calling Terra Grunt, um, and it will it will it will like you know it's just a wrapper around the Terra you know the Terraform uh, CLI. Uh, so so yeah, so these are uh, kind of the next action items. Uh, uh, please please don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not trying to say like what you've done oh, that's, is that's bad. Fine, yeah. No no, this is this is fantastic. I mean like you know so you have the major uh, pieces in, which is which is fantastic. Uh, but now we need to kind of formalize it in a way that, you know, for example, like, you know, we should be able to take the exact thing um, and just create another environment. So, for example, like, you know, uh, I mean, not, it's not going to happen today, but there'll be a time when we'll have a dev environment, a staging environment, a testing environment, and a production environment, right? So instead of passing things at runtime, uh, you will have a file where once you create whatever you created as a module, you'll just be passing values to it. As though you are calling other Terraform pieces, you know, so we, we, which would be pretty cool. So, um, yeah. So essentially, like what you've done is great. Uh, but you know what? Like, you know, I, I'm not sure. Like, you know, when you actually stop sharing, uh, you know, you, you should probably show your demo. Like, I mean, we definitely want to see your demo. Uh, <laughs> okay. But, but yeah, I mean, these these are the next steps for you. Uh, uh, the reason why I tried to rush in was actually the time concern. I'm, I'm really sorry. Like, I'm, I'm not trying to jump into that, 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 or something. Like, but I'm like, I really yeah, appreciate I'm your uh, input. Like, yeah. I, uh, as I said, like I'm still learning a lot of things. Like, uh, yeah. Um, so, 
I have an uh, Terraform installed in my system, and so uh, just want to give the demo of this command, uh, the, this Terraform. Once if we start applying, like we get like um, API gateway, gets, we get all the details like what's going to be created in uh, AWS and uh, for the API gateway for the DynamoDB and as well as for the AWS instance. And so it's like it's, it's asking for our uh, uh, final approval. We have to say yes, and then like it's created. Uh, let me open. AWS console, just give me a second. <clears throat> Did you guys already talk about um, storing state for Terraform? Uh, no, actually, this is the first, I mean, uh, I briefly mentioned about this last week, but, uh, you know, I uh, we didn't concretely have any discussions beyond that. Okay. Uh, but like I said, I mean, um, I have, I have, uh, you know, uh, uh, some some old core, like you know, which we can just just start consume and start running with it, uh, which I'll I'll give it to Pawan and like you know probably like you know, he can actually uh, benefit from that. Uh, that's awesome. So we do have so, a running instance. Well, we do have running instance and we do have uh, running DynamoDB. Uh, we do have the tables created and we do have. Uh, where is that API gateway? Yes, here it is. We do have an API gateway created over here. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I just want to delete it because I don't want to keep it for a long time. And so, absolutely. Let's destroy it. Uh, what is that? Destroy, right, yes. It's, it's destroy, destroy, yeah. Terraform, destroy. Oh, destroy. Um, so, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is a great start. Nice. So Very good. Uh, it's asking for confirmation and it's it's done. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, three to be destroyed. Yes, yeah. It's destroyed. Like yeah. And if you want, like it, then let let me go and open it again. Uh, be easy to Yeah, zero running instance and like it has been shut down. Fantastic. Um. One other thing, uh, Pawan, uh, is the uh, certificate thing. Uh, when you can, you know, uh, we need to actually investigate the AWS Certificate Manager. Uh, one good thing with uh, Terraform is that Terraform can actually work with that as well. Okay, sure. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Uh, four minutes or 3.5. Yeah. So uh, maybe circling back to Vanilla, um, <coughs> Vanilla, I was going to ask if there is a, a particular area that we could talk about a little bit that um, where you'd feel comfortable with, um, you know, the, the thing to do there. And uh, I know one of the things that came to mind, I don't know if it's of interest, but just is Istio specific, um, is the potential integration of Istio Vet. Uh, into yeah. meshery yeah i did see your comment on the issue so yeah that's definitely i think uh, have so i can look at that in the coming week and yeah um, maybe we can maybe i can have a look at the linkerd part as well uh, just to start off with Ooh. so yeah, yeah i keep Oh, nice. Sorry, you got me all so excited. I couldn't help but interrupt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's very good. You know, one of the things that uh, I need to raise my hand and sign up for is, um, is the broader socialization of the performance uh, benchmark. I'm sorry, the benchmark performance spec. Um, which I think is easier for some of the other vendors, some of the other projects to weigh in on um, because it's literally just a three-part um, YAML file. Um, 
as I go to do that, Garish, do you know, um, and I guess actually before I ask this, as I go to do that, I can copy the, um, the mailing list that we have for layer five. It's community at layer5.io. I'm going to go ahead and, and um, copy that mailing list such that uh, who's ever interested and who's ever subscribed will uh, be a part of the conversation as well, in case you want to jump in. Uh, a question that I had, a question that I had had there, Garish, was, um, do you know if the Ford IO output is uh, looks very similar to the spec as it is today? How compatible is uh, it? I am. Uh, I'm sorry. I remember seeing this question, but I totally lost it. Um, uh, sorry about that. But uh, yeah, to answer your question, uh, they are not. Okay. Uh, so this spec is uh, is pretty much custom made plus uh, at least like you know the, the, the version like you know which uh, where it is now it actually has a lot more intricate details about the steel if I remember correctly mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so yeah like I mean the four IOs data is like you know essentially it's like you know uh, think of it like you know it's, it looks almost like a time series data like you know it's, it's just like a you know, bunch of uh, points with uh, very little metadata at the top. Or, I mean, like, you know, a starting point like, of the JSON, like, you know, contains some little metadata. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, so, uh, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that it does not have any information about the infrastructure on mm. which it's run because mm. it's it's client-side data, right? So Yeah, and how far do, uh, how, of the results that come back, that's more of a time series uh, bit of information, how large are those files? Is that just a summary? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, the size of those again, like you know, it depends on how long you run the test. Mm -hmm. So if, um, at least in Meshery, like I mean, uh, all the demos I've shown are like for like one minute, uh, and for for one minute, like you know, we don't get a lot of data points. So like the the size of the files are pretty small. I think even if we run it for 20, 30 minutes, uh, it might it might still be like you know uh, in in KB. I don't think it'll even hit uh, much of MB. So okay, yeah. so it may be that yeah. You know, just in thinking about this out loud with you guys, I think right now this particular spec, um, it does, it really does only two of the three things that I had said before. Um, it identifies um, your environment, it, you know, the, the environment in which the test is going to be run. And then it also identifies um, specifics about the test itself, like how many requests per second for how long, uh, right. you know, how many right. And then the results, um, there it, there isn't a space for that in here, and there, there can certainly be a um, a linkage to results, like a an idea, um, a placeholder for putting in the location of the results. Um, but just thinking this through, maybe maybe it's not. It probably it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to try to stuff all the results back into the very same file. Um, but rather, this is a two pieces of metadata, or you know, there's a results file or set of files with um, this spec file, this metadata file that relates to it. Right. Okay. Um, so, of the two parts which you just mentioned, the second part is what we are getting. I would say from Ford IO, like in the sense it, it talked about like you know the throughput, the time for which the test was run, when it started, um, etc. Um, and uh, what, uh, and the latency. So so these are data we get from Four IO. Of the first part, if if I can, uh, if we can take a take a minute, um, since we are collecting a queue config file in a context, I think we have the power to talk to the Kubernetes APIs and figure out what version of Kubernetes that's run. Uh, what CPUs, sorry, what, how many nodes are there in the cluster, how many CPUs, memory, network I.O., I mean, like, all the metadata we can get from Kubernetes, uh, I think we should be able to get it in Meshery, uh, including, uh, like, for example, Istio, if it is Istio, like, no, we can get the version of Istio, et cetera. So I think we should be able to get all the metadata uh, to characterize the test from the Kubernetes APIs uh, through Meshery. Okay, maybe and even information about the nodes themselves. So like, the... yeah, I think uh, I mean if they are available, um, I'm not sure how 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 much detailed information is available from Kubernetes APIs, but I am pretty sure that like for example like whatever you can get from kubectl, 
are pretty much available through Cube, uh, Cube API server. So essentially, yeah. uh, if we can get this data uh, from kubectl, like you know, I mean, like you know, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it can get you the number of nodes, which I've seen personally too many times. Uh, with the CPU and the, the, essentially the quota uh, of uh, quota that's assigned to the cluster itself, like et cetera, I'm pretty sure like, you know, there should be APIs for that as well. Uh, I can probably take a look at it probably later next week uh, because the first half of the week I'll be focused on the UI work. Um, and uh, yeah, we can probably start getting all the metadata from the cluster. Now, given that, you know, for now, we are focused only on Kubernetes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. As we go to wrap up, I want to end as Vanille potentially looks at um, the possible Istio vet integration as well as the possible, um, as you, you kind of look at the maybe the Linkerd adapter. Um, Vanille, I just want to make sure that you've got um, the permissions that you might need to, um, to move forward unencumbered. Um, and so yeah, you do. I think you're in the contributors group and uh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. No, good, okay. Uh, uh, Pavon, do we need to, do, do, I'm sensitive about, um, at Pavon, I know you've got a little more time than Vanilla, so I'm sensitive to uh, keeping him past the hour. Um, Pavon, do we have anything else that we want to talk about? Um, I know you need a place for a little bit of an S3 uh, Terraform state storage script. Um, you need a different AWS account and a place to store some secrets. Um, do we need to talk about anything else? Uh, I'm good as of now. Like, uh, if I have more questions, I can ping on the chat chat room. Nice. Excellent. Okay. Um, and then, guys, I guess both Pavan and Vanilla, if you guys, as you guys are thinking about the project and if, if it comes to you, um, really the notion. Okay, I just want to add here, like, I'm sorry for this event, like, uh, I just want to add, um, uh, Giri, he's telling that, like, he's going to expose something for uh, Kubernetes, right? Like, I'm good at Kubernetes, I'm saying, like, uh, I, I know a little bit of Kubernetes because I work on, like, implementations and, like, uh, deployment of applications in the Kubernetes. So it's like, uh, if anything, I can help on the Kubernetes, definitely I'll be open for that. Awesome. Uh, I just created a, a task in Meshery. I'm going to assign that to you, Pawan. Yeah, fine. Awesome. Definitely. Like, uh, yeah. uh, Kubernetes, like, yes, like, uh, um, I'm good. Like, from the past six months, like, I'm um, extensively working only on the Kubernetes part, uh, implementation nice. of Kubernetes, and like, uh, in, um, deploying of applications, migrating to the Docker containers, images, and like, yeah, into deploying to the Kubernetes. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Like, if I have more work on Kubernetes, I'm happy to contribute. Sounds good. I'm sending you some tasks. Yeah, sure. Uh, Pawan, what is your uh, what is your GitHub ID? I mean, do uh, uh do we have Pawan in? Uh... We do. <laughs> we do. Okay. Uh, uh Pawan, can you actually give me your uh, GitHub ID? Yeah, I I P U. Uh, like, uh, yeah, it's uh, my first name and last name, name, but like, yeah, uh, I I P U. All right, very good. Um, gentlemen, uh, anything else? You're going to end the community meeting? And, um, uh, all right, nice. Vanilla, I've got, I've got high hopes, man. I've got fingers crossed. Got, uh... <laughs> yeah, uh, I think we're doing good. And yeah, I'll, I'll do st some stuff next week, mostly mid next week. I have something coming up on Monday, Tuesday, but yeah, after that, I'll be working on it. Nice, nice, very good. Okay. Oh, gentlemen, th thanks, thanks a bunch. Uh, um, same time next week. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you so much. See you guys. Bye, guys. Bye bye.